All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to my pitch. You may call me Neil R. For those of you wondering, I recently changed my pseudonym. This presentation is being hosted on the Rescue Business YouTube channel, uh, but I must stress that Simple Computer Company is not affiliated with Risky Business, which is my personal passion project. That said, a successful business would grant me the financial stability to continue to pursue uh, risky business in my free time. Uh, yeah, so my major influences and uh, inspirations are Jonathan Blow and Casey Muratori. And I'd like to take a moment to shout out a, a couple talks that they gave. The first one I'd like to recommend you take some time to watch is Jonathan Blow's talk entitled uh, Preventing the Collapse of Civilization. And I'd also like to recommend that you take the time to watch Casey Muratori's talk entitled The 30 Million Line Problem. With that out of the way, uh, let's begin. So this is a pitch about a simple computer company. What does that mean? Simple easily understood or done, presenting no difficulty, a simple solution, reliable, consistently good in quality or performance, able to be trusted, a reliable source of information. Ask yourself, would you use these words to describe the computing devices we have today? I know I wouldn't. The goal is straightforward to make computers worthy of being called simple and reliable. Our business would bring simplicity and reliability to anything that might be described as a computer in the modern sense of the word. In the first uh, part of this talk, I'm going to discuss a number of hard problems our society faces today and why simple, reliable computing infrastructure is necessary to address them. In the second part, we will go over the details of how this company would be structured and the costs involved. This pitch is partially intended for investors, but I'm also looking for talented individuals who would like to work at this company. Perhaps my most important goal with this talk is to find business partners to take on CEO and CFO roles. I'm a programmer, not a businessman. When people with business expertise are on board, they can help pitch this to investors directly with better numbers, <laughs> as well as handle the various aspects of running a business that I am not first in. If there is one thing I'd like you to take away from this talk, it is that I can't do this alone. I need your help. Allow me, if you will, to share my vision. Our story begins with the sun. What you see before you is a coronal mass ejection, or CME. With a snap of the magnetic field, plasma is released from the sun's corona in a magnificent display. CMEs burst away from the sun, and every so often by chance, one will be pointed directly towards the Earth. When a CME hits our planet, it creates a great geomagnetic storm. In 1859, exactly that happened. It was known as the Carrington event. And to think, at that time, society wasn't reliant on electronics like we are today. They only had to deal with telegraph systems being disrupted. If a CME hits Earth today, it will wipe out our satellites. It will cause blackouts, damages, and extended outages of the electrical grid on a global scale. Your personal devices will likely be fine, but they'll be useless without power for days or even weeks. In 2012, a CME barely missed Earth by a mere nine days, and we can expect another to directly hit us in our lifetime. If we know this is going to happen, why aren't we preparing for it? A CME hitting Earth directly again is not a question of if, it is a question of when. COVID-19 shows us what happens when we know a catastrophe is around the corner and we don't adequately prepare. To give context for those of you watching this in the future, this uh, presentation is being given during 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Scientists have been warning us for years that a global pandemic was not a question of if, but rather a question of when. 
Uh, we even knew that Chinese wet markets would <laughs> be a likely source of such a thing happening. Despite knowing this, the threat of a global pandemic wasn't taken seriously enough, and now look where we are. So many terrible things are happening in 2020 that it feels like civilization is collapsing. What if it is not one catastrophe that destroys us, but rather a slew of challenges that overwhelm us? Ask yourself, what would happen if a CME hit Earth in 2020? Would it be the straw that breaks the camel's back? Is the camel's back already broken? COVID-19 has been a rare chance to see what the world would be like with uh, drastically reduced human activity. The harsh truth is that we cannot simply change our behavior and live with what we've done. We are on the Titanic, and we, do, we need to do more than rearrange deck chairs. We desperately need dreamers and visionaries to stare in the face of the impossible and take on challenges like reversing climate change. If we continue to march the path we're on, wildlife habitat destruction will bring with it more pandemics, one symptom among many of a dying planet. Climate change brings with it droughts, water scarcity, and loss of biodiversity, all of which threaten food production. A warming planet melts ice. Melting ice rises waters. Rising waters floods coastlines. Flooded coastlines cause mass migration. Mass migration and famine breeds conflict. Conflict. Conflict turns to war. Pestilence, war, famine, death. While the far horsemen ride, we are at our greatest risk of nuclear annihilation. Our world has been on the brink of destruction since the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Pandora, Pandora's box was opened in 1945 with the atom bomb. We haven't destroyed ourselves yet because our lever, leaders understand that a nuclear strike will result in mutually assured destruction. However, if you look into it, there have been a number of close calls that are truly shocking. Perhaps it's only a matter of time. As humanity struggles to survive a dying world, who is to say someone won't pull that trigger in a moment of desperation? That's only one technology posing an existential threat, but there are others, and we're going to talk about a few more. Many people worry about artificial general intelligence. Uh, ask yourself this. If we discovered another species on Earth that was destroying our planet and posed a serious existential threat to all known life, how would we handle that situation? We certainly wouldn't let that animal go about its business uninterrupted. Humans naturally fear the idea of a Terminator-style AI because on some level, we all understand that unless we evolve as a species, we are a threat to Earth itself. Humans need to be controlled, contained, or eliminated. Despite our flaws, I'm not saying we should give up hope in ourselves. We can do better. Besides, don't you want to go along for the ride? I can't tell you when artificial general intelligence will, will arrive. What I can say is this. The human brain is a product of at least 3.77 billion years of evolution. Our brains are not optimized for raw processing speed or accuracy, but we have a wonderful balance of compute for such low power consumption and cost. Humanity acts in aggregate as a hive mind, thanks in part to technology like the internet, enabling us to collect and access most of human knowledge and communicate in real time with anyone across the planet. In this regard, the human brain has scaled horizontally to an impressive 7.8 billion cores and counting. It is not sufficient for an AI to simply achieve or surpass the intelligence of any one human. It must do so with the competitive power consumption and cost so that it may scale horizontally to the same degree. Whether we will need to worry about artificial general intelligence is really a question of economics and whether evolution has us stuck in a local optimum that can be surpassed. Given that we can't currently answer that question, we should treat it as a serious possibility. Artificial intelligence as it exists today is far from the kind of from that kind of artificial general intelligence, but it is posing a different threat. Advances in techniques such as deep learning are actively being incorporated into anything and everything. This in infrastructure is actively being built, and it's changing society in ways we couldn't predict. Deepfakes have the potential to destroy people's lives. 
As the technology improves, it will likely become impossible to tell whether a video of a world leader speaking is real or fake, and the consequences of such a thing could be extreme. Impacts potentially range from revenge on individuals or public figures to this technology fueling riots, swinging elections, perhaps even bringing about genocide or war. Algorithms increasingly incorporating technology like deep learning are controlling our lives. While I was writing this talk, a movie came out about this subject. It's called The Social Dilemma, and I highly recommend you watch it. The algorithms powering social media and uh, misaligned incentives for journalists as well have resulted in a, a culture where it is becoming increasingly difficult to distinguish the signal from the noise. Like a Rubik's Cube being scrambled, I know the pieces fit because I watched them fall away. But it's not trivial to bring them back together. Uh, the picture on your screen, by the way, is an infographic about colony collapse disorder in bees. This is a serious problem by itself, as bees play a vital role in our ecosystem as uh, pollinators. We don't know exactly what causes this phenomenon, but there are a number of possible causes, and it could very well be a combination of factors. Despite having a queen and plenty of food, Colonies suffering from CCD lose their worker bees. To me, CCD looks like a social phenomenon. A breakdown of communication among bees resulting in social disintegration. I look at CCD and I think, my god, the same thing's happening to us. Fake news, post-truth politics, deep learning. And the wide-reaching effects of social media has burned a hole between us, so we cannot seem to reach an end, crippling our communication. We see it reflected in the humor of our youth, employing post-irony, meta-irony, and post-truth satire. I know the pieces fit, because I watched them tumble down. But I know that we can employ logic and reason to bring the pieces back together. rediscover communication. Now I'd like it to us to turn our eyes to the future. So far this talk has been uh, rather depressing, but we're going to turn to a more positive note. What you see before you now is a map of the cosmic microwave background. This image fills me with hope for the future and a sense of duty. Roughly 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe had cooled to a point where hydrogen atoms could form, causing the entire universe to gloriously burst into light, as photons were no longer being scattered off free electrons. As the universe expands, those photons are redshifted, which decreases their energy. This is why they are in the microwave regime today. It also means that this information will eventually be lost to time, having completely redshifted beyond detection trillions of years from now. The knowledge we've gained from this DMB has taught us so much. It's a smoking gun for the Big Bang and the basis of our standard model of cos cosmology. The CMB has given us a crucial peek into the early, the very early universe, and it helps us understand what this universe is, where we come from. Imagine for a moment that we fail to overcome the challenges we face when our civilization collapses. Imagine trillions of years in the future, some intelligent species like us evolves again on some planet that hasn't yet formed. They look up to the night sky and shout into the void, what is this world? Where do we come from? But that cold, lonely void never answers them back. I think that would be a tragedy. We have a duty as a species to record this history, to spread out among the stars and propagate this information into the future. 
I want that species trillions of years from now to be told the story of how some clever apes on an ancient planet called Earth discovered the secrets of the universe and went on to shepherd life and knowledge across all space and time. Now let's come back down to Earth. I'm not proposing a solution to climate change or effective uh, nuclear disarmament or <laughs> anything like that. However, our society depends on our computing infrastructure and whatever the solutions to these hard problems look like, I reckon they'll need the help of computers. Working on our computers, our computing infrastructure is low hanging fruit that is nonetheless essential to solving the problems we face both today and tomorrow. We can work to make our satellites and power grid resistant to CMEs. We can reduce our carbon footprint by making our computing infrastructure draw less power by virtue of being simple and efficient. Think about the amount of productivity society as a whole has lost while waiting for their computer to boot, update, or because their device is malfunctioning when they need it most. For any one person, it might seem like a minor inconvenience at the time, but that cost adds up over time for everyone making the aggregate productivity loss of society immeasurable. Simple and reliable computers will enable our best and brightest to work more efficiently while they come up with their innovative world transforming solutions to problems like reversing climate change or denuclearization of our nations. We can build ethical hardware and software that respect the user and their rights. It's time to get back to the good, honest mom and pop model of selling products. This is why we need a simple computer company. Now that we've talked about what a uh, simple computer company's goals are and the motivation behind it, the obvious question to ask is, where do we start? I believe the best place to start is to make a laptop. There aren't any great laptops on the market currently. Companies these days are more focused on markets such as phones, tablets, and wearables. Laptops have a broad appeal in that unlike a device like a phone, they are practical for doing actual work while still being relatively portable. This is especially relevant in an age where remote work is becoming the norm. As such, a laptop is an ideal market to target first because it is straightforward to make one better than the competition and it can be used for real work with a broader appeal than something like a workstation. The goal is to make a product that leaves a lasting impression on the consumer. If you want the best in the world, you get a simple computer. We want to own our luxury model laptop to be seen as a flex and thus cement itself naturally in pop culture and the public consciousness. The reason for doing a luxury model first is twofold. It's not just about making a statement, a flex. There's also the practical consideration of economies of scale. The first product we make will have the largest R&D cost as we are building from scratch. Future products have that previous work to build on. I would expect the luxury model laptop to be more expensive, but in the same ballpark as a high-end MacBook. Ideally, we would produce mid-tier and low-end models in the future. The low-end model would be priced comparably to a Chromebook and ideal for students. The mid-tier model would be ideal for anyone who wants something better than the low-end model but doesn't want to commit to something as expensive as the luxury model. The main task at hand is to achieve an order of magnitude less complexity than the competition. I'm talking about both hardware, software, and the interface between them. I should note that when I say complexity here, I mean any reasonable metric as there is no precise measure for such a thing. As for the CPU, CPU will use a uh, RISC-V. That said, we would still want to, uh, things like out of order, superscalar, multi-car, vector extensions, etc. We want to push as much performance out of the cores as we can get. However, the specs may not be on the same level as like you know Intel or AMD chips, but uh, lower specs than the competition is acceptable as long as the perceived performance is higher. Our edge will come from the simplicity of the system. We'd likely uh, partner with sci 5 for the CPU. In general, we would try to have as much of the hardware be open, you know, be as open as possible. Uh, as far as the hardware software interface goes, we we want to make it trivial to write bare metal software. 
It is crucial that the hardware and firmware exposes an interface that is so trivial to program for that it is not only easy, but also the natural thing to do. So let's say you write a piece of software, such as like a game that targets bare metal. You would be able to make a bootable USB stick or SD card with the game on it, connect the stick or insert the card, power the laptop on, and a boot menu instantly appears, giving you the option to boot directly into the game. Alternatively, you can boot into the installed operating system on the internal SSD. I want to stress that booting must be perceptually instantaneous. Just hit the power button and you're ready to go. Now let's say you boot into the operating system and then plug in the stick or insert the card with the game on it. This time the OS pops up a dialog asking if you want to run the game. If you do, the game will run seamlessly alongside whatever other applications you're running. To the game, it appears to be running on bare metal, but in reality, the game is running sandboxed in a virtual machine. This would be a hypervisor-based operating system in the same vein as Cubes OS. If, in, if one wants to run existing software on the system that we have today, uh, you would boot a Linux VM, which would serve Linux applications seamlessly on, alongside your bare metal applications. If Microsoft supports Windows on RISC-V in the future, you will be able to run Windows applications in a Windows VM in the same fashion. Alternatively, you could install an operating system like Linux directly instead of using the simple operating system and use the device like any other normal laptop. If you saw my RISC-V demo, uh, PC demo at Handmade Seattle 2019, You'll know that RISC-V systems can already run Linux desktop environments. Regarding firmware, we would use something like Open Firmware instead of BIOS or UEFI. Open, open Firmware used Forth, though, uh, so we might want to replace that with something else. Uh, we'll come back to this point shortly also. Unlike most devices today, which easily break down, our devices will be designed to last a lifetime and operate normally under less than ideal conditions. Do you live in a tropical country? You won't have to worry about our devices overheating. It'll work fine everywhere on Earth. This laptop will be designed to take a beating. Whether it's getting knocked off the bed frequently or soft drinks spilled all over it, a simple laptop will stand the test of time. Not only that, but we're going to do it with style. This won't be some bulky, rugged beast, but rather a slim and lightweight design made with quality components and clever engineering. And no, we won't force updates down your throat. P.S. It'll have a headphone jack. We aim to please. A big thing for me is community, which is why I want to take a moment to talk about how a simple computer can potentially utilize another project coming from the handmade community. I'm talking about Alan Webster and Ryan Fleury's Dion. And if you were not able to catch their talk yesterday, I highly recommend you watch the recording whenever it is available. Dion is in its infancy, so I'm going to go over both a short-term vision of how our system would benefit from Dion and a long-term vision. Short-term, Dion can test the waters as a scripting language. Taking that line of thinking further, uh, Diane could provide a front end that acts as a full-blown shell. I would love for the standard shell of simple computers to be Dion based. Uh, Abner's terminal emulator is another exciting prospect. In any case, uh, we could provide Dion with our simple operating system as a development environment once those guys have it mature enough to be shippable. And uh, long term, I would love for our firmware to use Dion. Uh, our firmware could use Dion instead of or on top of Forth. Someday uh, we could even integrate Dion with the operating system, but it's much too early to say what that would even look like or entail. One thing I, would, I want to stress though is that uh, we don't want to force Dion down people's throats the way Apple has done with Objective-C and Swift how Google has done with Java and I don't know how it's pronounced, Kotlin, Kotlin, whatever, you know, whatever that new one is, or whatever Microsoft uh, has been trying to do with like Metro style apps. 
simple computers uh, will not have a preferred language. If you're expected to write your application in a preferred language or are forced into it even for every platform you use, you're worse off than if you had to write a version for each target and assembly. We want people to be able to write programs for our devices in Dion, Odin, Zig, or whatever they feel like. Now that you've had a taste of uh, what we'll be working on, uh, let's talk business structure. This will be a, a US-based company that hires internationally. Non-US citizens will probably be hired as contractors, but these kinds of decisions are where I would really like to have partners with business experience to make that call. Work would be remote-based as much as possible. Uh, People involved with actual physical proto prototyping or production will need to work on site and in-person meetings may be conducted as necessary. This will probably be an LLC or some kind of limited partnership. And again, this is where I need partners with business expertise to make the call. We'll need a business address legally. And for on-site work, I think it would be ideal for us to have like a warehouse somewhere in the Midwest, such as Minnesota, with a low cost of living. We would use that warehouse as a machine shop with CNC tools, 3D printers, injection molding stuff, etc. The building can also serve as our factory floor. I want our employees to have great working conditions uh, to enjoy working with us without having to s sacrifice time away from family or things like that. I'm thinking a 40 hour work week with flexible hours outside of meetings is ideal. That said, great things take hard work and working overtime during crunch may be necessary. I highly recommend reading the transcript of Paul Edwards interviewing Bob Caldwell, the chief architect of Intel's Pentium Pro 2, 3, and 4 processors. When it comes to overtime and crunch, to quote Mr. Caldwell, if you find yourself on the critical path of a project-wide effort, everybody takes their turn in the hot seat sooner or later. When it is your butt in the hot seat, work on work. Get off the critical path as soon as possible. Work as much as it takes to get back out of the hot seat and give someone else a turn. And when that happens, go see your wife and kids. Given that most of the work will be remote, uh, Let's talk about how collaboration will be done. First, uh, I'm fine with people streaming their work. Uh, in my own personal experience, I found streaming to have a lot of benefits, such as viewer collaboration and being able to reference the past recordings. If it's, if it's up to me, <laughs> real-time chat will be done over IRC, but I know kids these days love things like Discord, so I'm willing to compromise to find a setup that keeps everyone on the team happy. I've already set up a professional ProtonMail account for a simple computer company so that our employees can collaborate over email. We'll use GitLab uh, for hosting our code, and ideally open source most or all of it. And last, lastly, uh, most meetings will be conducted remotely using Google Meets and will cover travel expenses if in-person meetings are necessary. Now, I'm going to walk you through the numbers I've estimated for our first year of operation, but I want to make the caveats clear first. For estimating employees' salaries, I picked a simple tiered structure, but in reality, salaries would probably be given as ranges. Uh, another important factor is each individual's living situation. Given that the work is mostly remote, employees would have the luxury of being able to live wherever they like with a low cost of living, but naturally will consider your living, your living situation when it comes to salary. My estimates are assuming everyone is living somewhere with a low cost of living, such as the rural Midwest. I'd also like to stress that I'm giving an estimate for our first year of operation, but that is not how long it would take to have our first product ready to ship. With that out of the way, let's go over the roles our team will initially consist of. First and foremost are the business roles. As I've said, the main thing I'm hoping this pitch will accomplish uh, is to attract uh, 
people with business experience who would like to partner with me and handle roles such as CEO and CFO. These people will be able to help make business-related decisions, come up with better numbers, and help pitch this directly to investors to raise capital. They can help with general business management as well as accounting and secretarial roles. For my estimate, I've tiered their salaries at $157,000. And uh, I'd like to give myself the title of COO and give myself a programmer salary of uh, 91000 I would handle leading the company in terms of vision, conducting team meetings, and working on the software side of things as a systems programmer. For a CTO, I want someone who has both systems programming and hardware engineering experience, and I put them in the 157,000 salary tier. We'll also need a CAD designer, and I'd like them to be able to work on sites to be able to directly work with our 3D printers, injection molding, molding and the like. Uh, I've tiered that role at 54,000. For the hardware side of things, We'll have a chief architect and engineer, chief engineer roles, which I've tiered at $157,000. Uh, we'll also have a machinist working on site to do CNC and general shop type of work. Like the CAD designer, I've tiered them at $54,000. Electrical and hardware engineers, I've tiered at 91000 and uh, I should mention that I'm not sure if electrical engineer is the right title, but I intend that role to mean someone to work on the power usage of our devices, batteries, and uh, things like that. I think thermal engineer as well as circuit design engineer are more specialized roles, and as such I've tiered them at 157,000. For software roles, we have firmware engineer, kernel engineer, and systems programmer roles. And these are essentially all just systems programmer roles, but I've given a few different titles to suggest the kind of backgrounds I'd like to have people coming from. All of these roles are tiered at 91,000. For more specialized roles, we have uh, critical systems engineer, and security engineer, and uh, both of those are tiered at 157,000. Regarding production roles, uh, we'll need a supply chain manager and a compliance engineer, and I've tiered these roles at 91,000. As for benefits, for US citizens, citizens we'll offer dental, medical, and vision benefits. For non-US citizens, we'll likely hire as contractors and compensate for lack of benefits with appropriately higher pay. Once again, this is the kind of thing where I really need the help of people with business experience to make these calls. Given all this, I'm looking to raise roughly 4.2 million in capital. The breakdown is as follows. I'm assuming we go with an LLC, which has a $155 filing fee. With every role I've talked about filled, our employee salary total will be $2,249,000. Employee benefits would be on the order of $85,500 from what I understand. For legal consultation, I'm simply taking the approach of setting aside a big hunk of money to draw from as needed. I've gone with 40000 for this purpose. I've estimated the gross rent of our commercial property to be 141000 which is again, I'm assuming we are talking about a warehouse in the Midwest. On top of that, I figured $500 for liability insurance. I approached market research more or less the same way I approach legal consultation, which is to say I've allocated a big hunk of money to draw from as needed, and I've allocated uh, 500000 for this purpose. 
Money for equipment and supplies would be primarily put towards tools for our warehouse, and I've allocated a million to get that started. For cost of keeping a website online, I've allocated 650. And uh, one more big hunk of money to draw from as needed is for business trips, and I've allocated 220,000 for that. For taxes, my understanding is that we probably won't need to pay anything in the seed stage given that we're not going to be making a profit right away, but we will need to file. And I've allocated uh, 1,500 to have a professional make sure that is done properly. Uh, once again, I want help from people who know more about this kind of thing, which is why I need people with business experience to partner with me. Doing a, a final total, uh, we arrive at an estimate of um, $4,238,305. And uh, I've done a secondary estimate using the same methodology. This estimate is for starting small, by which I mean just getting some business partners on board and dealing with uh, getting all the business-related decisions ironed out. From there, we would need to prepare better estimates and seek additional capital. Once additional capital is secured, we would be able to fill out our team and really get the ball rolling. My estimate for this is, is around like half a million dollars. And uh, this estimate includes the LLC filing fee and the employee salaries and benefits for your CEO, CFO, and me. Um, it also includes uh, the, uh, yeah, the benefits and uh, 10,000 set aside for legal consultation, 650 for our website costs, and uh, 40,000 for business trips. And again, I've allocated 1,500 for having a professional handle our tax filing. This gives, gives a grand total of $470,805. In conclusion, I'm looking for part, potential partners with business experience to start this company with me and take on the CEO and CFO roles. I'm seeking at least around you know half a million in capital to get started, and I'm I'm expecting to really need more like 4.2 million to really get the ball rolling for our first year. I need your help. The most important thing to take away from this talk is that I can't do this without your help. If you would like to help me make this a reality, please contact me at neo at getsimple.computer. To discuss this idea publicly with like-minded individuals, there's also a forum topic on the jobs board of the Handmade Network forums, and I encourage you to discuss it there. That's it. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to my talk. You can find Simple Computer Company on the web at getsimple.computer. Get simple, everybody.